plenty of room. Yeah, come on up. There's some right here. There's some right there. Yeah. That's all right. Don't worry. Now we all know. <laughs> we'll, all, we'll, all know that. we'll all know that that's why. It's not because of something I said. <coughs> Though I might say something. <laughs> <laughs> all This workshop, uh, we've got about 50 minutes, right? So um, we're gonna we're gonna dive right into things. Um, uh, I'll talk about the structure of the workshop in a second, but basically what we're looking to do today is to uh, open up a conversation around uh, sort of privilege. for those things and how do we maybe have some impact on those things to change things. Um, but first off, before I even get started in the structure of the, the, the workshop or, or any of the details, uh, even introducing the panel, so let's just look at this little um, little thought experiment. Don't, don't uh, say anything, uh, if you, uh, you know, just, just process it for a second. So a father and son are in a car crash, the father dies, the son is rushed to the hospital, but the surgeon says, I can't operate, the boy is my son. How is this possible? So take, take five seconds. Uh, just think through. Any thoughts? How is this possible? Surgeon could be his mom, right? Surgeon also could be his second dad, right? Could have two dads, right? So again, this is a this is a, a, a tiny little tiny little uh, uh, thought experiment, but right, but one that can expose uh, for some of us uh, where we might have a bias around who a surgeon is supposed to be. Right? And there are these things that happen throughout society in so many different ways. Right? So bias exists at societal levels, at familial levels, at environmental levels, all, all, all different ways. And this workshop is, uh, is going to try and focus sort of on a specific uh, side of things around uh, how we individually engage with these things. Because they exist institutionally. Right? Think about funding. Think about promotions. Think about uh, hiring all those different sides of things, but they also operate individually, right, in terms of our own lives and our own experiences. So what we want to do today is we want to, um, for the purpose of these 50 minutes, we want to kind of accept as fact that bias exists, uh, and it exists in lots of complex ways. Uh, you know, I could quote to you lots of studies, I could quote to you lots of, you know, uh, facts and figures. Or come, come on up into the circle gang, just so, you know, it was only a, only a few, uh, few extra chairs, so, so please, just, just jump right in. Um, you know, I could quote to you like, oh, 5% of the industry is uh, uh, female audio engineers, or there's only 2% that are producers, but what we want to do actually is not debate that stuff today. We want to just ask that you accept it for the next 50 minutes or 45 minutes at this point. If, uh, if you disagree, just suspend your disagreement for the next 45 minutes, uh, like you're going to the theater or something. You know, it'll, it'll still be out there uh, outside the door when you, when you come back, yeah? So, um, so if we all just agree that it does exist, then what we want to be able to do is engage in a conversation about how do we talk about these things? How do we influence these things? How do we take individual responsibility when sometimes it can feel hard to talk about, sometimes it can feel confusing, sometimes it can feel like a bit of a minefield to even get into a conversation? So what we're going to do today is we, this panel here, uh, and uh, I'll let folks introduce themselves, uh, are going to talk for a little bit at the start. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do a couple of different activities that ask you all and, and you folks online. You'll find the links uh, on the YouTube channel, yeah? So um, we will do an activity that asks you to, to sort of participate in some of these thought experiments. And then we'll get into some small groups to have some relatively brief conversations to just sort of open up some of the discussion based on what the activity was. And we'll come back together, do it again. So we'll do a few of these, and then we'll circle up at the end with some, with some questions. So, why don't we just to, to dive right in, let's do a quick round of introductions. So my name is um, someone who uses the microphone often. Uh, my name is Corey Harewer. I am the Chief People Officer at Rolly. Um, and uh, I am Corey. Uh, I am Community Manager. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Community Manager at Rolly, uh, also a sound tech. I've studied sound tech here and in India. So um, yeah, lots of different things. Hello, my name is Rooks. I am a writer, producer, performer, and I'm also a specialist demonstrator for Rolly. Hi, I'm Sarah Gould. I'm director of sales at Rolly, and I'm also a sound engineer by profession. Great. So, uh, so what I thought we would start with is just to, to kind of dive right into to the experience of some of these folks uh, around, you know, around some of these different issues, around privilege and bias and, and, and what their experience has been. So maybe, Rooks, if we start with you, uh, 
would love to hear about just your experience as a gigging performer mm -hmm. um, in you know the music industry today, the music tech industry today. What what are maybe some common experiences for you or some things that you have encountered kind of regularly that, that, that feel pertinent to this conversation? Okay, well, um, in terms of examples, uh, they tend to fall into um, my kind of two areas of intersection, one of which is um, as, a, as a woman working in this industry, but also as a queer woman working in this industry. Um, as a queer woman, it can often be to do with presentation. So something I've noticed um, kind of as I move around in the industry is uh, I used to be a lot more feminine presenting than I am now. Um, I'm quite androgynous, as you can see. Um, but when I used to have longer blonde hair, uh, my blonde hair had always been something of a beacon for um, strangers shouting things at me, often in the street, often on the daily. And, uh, and since I cut my hair back, um, I noticed that just kind of the way that men interact with me is very different. Um, I find that I am being talked to rather than talked at. Um, I also find that men are more willing to make eye contact with me, which was a rather pleasing development, but a little bit kind of like oddly surprising, a little unsettling. Um, in terms of just being a woman in the industry, the examples are endless, but I will just pick a few. Um, in terms of, for example, I'm, I manage my own project, and that's something that I've chosen to do partly because I think I do quite a good job at it. And, uh, but interacting with um, promoters and venues to book gigs can sometimes be a bit of a gauntlet, especially if you're trying to contact them by email. I found that when I signed off as myself in emails, I found it quite hard to uh, get any responses back. However, when I invented a male colleague called James, I had a roughly 30% increase in return in terms of responses, um, even to something as simple as an inquiry. Um, I have also, uh, you know, my performance name and my producer name is Rooks is gender neutral and it's plural. So often I have been booked before, clearly without much investigation by promoters who thought I was an all male indie band. And then, uh, <laughs> and then express some disappointment to my face that I was not an all-male indie band, or even just a woman fronting a male band, um, which was quite a shocker. And, um, and again, that rolls over to things like there have been times when I've not been able to book venues, and the only way I have been able to book venues is when I've, had, I've asked a male friend to book them for me using the same money, but somehow because it's coming from a male bank account, that is acceptable, whereas coming from my bank account, apparently not. So it also rolls over into things like sound checks, um, which is a very interesting space. I've sometimes been denied a sound check when I've been the only woman on the bill um, in view of the justification that apparently the sound engineer knew my tech better than I did. It's never, ever the case. It was not a good performance. Luckily, the audience figured out that it was the sound tech's issue and not my issue. However, at the time, it's, it is very, very uncomfortable. I saw you, saw you nodding there, Sarah, around yeah, the I wasn't sound nodding check thing. in pleasure that right. she's <laughs> treated this way. <laughs> <laughs> just to clarify, I, Thank you. I, I was uh, nodding with the acknowledgement of just the comments around, uh, around sound tech. So I, I am a sound engineer by profession. I work in sales now, but I notice sort of these uh, situations every now and then. A good example, actually, I was um, I was in Johannesburg a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was doing a South Africa trip to launch the Rody brand in that region. Um, so as part of the go-to-market plan, we'd organised uh, an event, at, uh, kind of a cool venue um, in the centre of Johannesburg, and uh, there was about five guys all huddled around the mixing console. Um, trying to get it to work, and uh, I was setting up the roadie equipment, and I walked over to the console uh, just to set up the line and to do a line check, and they were like, oh, uh, do you want us to call the engineer? I said, no, no, I'm fine, and, uh, and, I s and they were like, it's not working, and I picked up the microphone and went, uh, it is now, <laughs> 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 and they were like, oh, then I was so surprised, and I said, well, yeah, I am, I am an engineer as well, and I just noticed there are sort of these situations actually where there's, there's expectations yeah. or, hmm. or things uh, settle down that way. I mean, when I first started in, in engineering and sound engineering was quite a few years ago um, and um, there definitely wasn't many women. I don't remember all of the studio jobs I had 
and pretty much all of the courses that I was on uh, were always an all-male environment. So I guess I've got used to it over the years and um, to the point where you don't really notice. And that's why I think the exercise here today is quite good because I think there's actually a lot of times where we don't actually notice some of the things that happen or the language we use or the way things are that shouldn't necessarily be like that. Mm. And um, I think now, because I've, I've, I've been in the industry, you know, before Roly as well, I've worked for other businesses in the industry. So quite a lot of people know me now, so I don't feel like I have to jump through as many hoops. I think I definitely did when I first started to prove that mm. I know what I'm talking about or I understand the different terms, terminologies, equipment and, and yeah. everything about the industry. But I think it's I think it's really interesting as an industry and as a community to think about these things in, in terms of actually how they reflect and interact with our with our daily lives and how we go about things and just yeah. improve general communications and these biases, you know, we're talking about them in a context here, but these biases seriously affect our decision making and I think as mm. a as a room of, you know, intellectual people that are doing some amazing creative things out in the world, it's good to challenge your biases and think more intelligently and creatively a, a around every decision that we make. So yeah. Porvi, Porvi, you were saying, because I remember you were talking about sort of courses and that kind of mm -hmm. thing, and Porvi, you actually did a <coughs> degree. Yeah, right, we a went to the in. same university. So, <coughs> yeah, I studied sound technology in India and in UK. And in India, the bias was more in your face, like uh, no women in the studio after 10 p.m. or, you know, like if they'd laugh at you if you asked even a basic question. So you couldn't get away with that here. But... Um, here, uh, there was a common theme that carried over, and that was of um, assumptions. So as soon as you enter, you're like, you're someone different. Um, you're, you're not like others, or you're not the normal. And um, you know, that's, that's, quite, that's quite an interesting thing. So for you all to relate, I would say, um, think about being a new kid in school, and um, immediately, you're, you're different. Um, you're assumed stupid, you're here by chance, or you need to be explained things differently, or better, or behavior is different around you. And imagine the rest of the years, all you have to do is you work in groups, you work on assignments, and you have to prove that, hey, it's OK. You don't have to explain that to me more than once. Or we're good. Like, I'm normal. I'm like you. Um, so that sort of um, battle of constantly changing people's mind or assumptions, um, it's quite exhausting. And then on top of that, I'm uh, from India. I'm brown. Uh, I'm a brown woman. so. There would be this, um, this like, I'm so surprised you're so good, and then I'm so surprised you're so good, but you're an Indian woman and I don't date Indian women. And it's just like, I don't really want to date you, or I wasn't really talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like the added thing on it. Like, hey, you're like on the top of the shit pile, good for you. So. <laughs> And, uh, what, uh, just, uh, and again, then we're, we're going to segue into, uh, into a, a getting folks into groups. And I'm going to pull in everybody into this center circle. Um, also, because you then went directly from university into working at Rolly, right? Yeah. So um, I actually was not going to apply for the, so it was a, my first role at Rolly was in the support, tech support role. And I wasn't going to apply for that role because I was like, oh, it's just going to be a boys club. It's the same thing over again. And um, my husband, who um, is also a sound tech, uh, said, Corby, um, you did a research on uh, how to use touch in sound tech. Like, this is the job for you. You need to go. So I applied, and it was interesting, you know, as a community, Roly is pretty aware of these biases, but um, our cr customers are, you know, would assume that I'm male because my name is Purvi, which people don't know is a female identifying name here. Uh, the feedback would be like, um, uh, Purvi, like, because it would be over email and chat, Purvi was amazing, give him a raise and whatnot. And that was really annoying because, you know, I worked so hard to get here and I had to, like, <coughs> battle all those assumptions. So we did an experiment. We were a mixed gender group uh, on the support team and we were um, different names. So I was Victoria, who was a sound tech I know. Um, then there was Emily, Michelle, Madeline, whatnot. And it was very interesting, uh, the responses people got, like, Victoria was kind of out of people's league, so everyone was very smiley and nice, and it sent me a lot of um, emo 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 emoticons, how do you say it? And then uh, Emily got asked out on a date, uh, Michelle got uh, strange photos being sent to her, uh, Madeline <laughs> had a stalker who came and spoke to her every day, so it was very interesting. <laughs> it was interesting to see that. <laughs> yeah, Emily slash Dave. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay, so, so uh, I think that what we'd like to do now, again, because uh, I think oftentimes some, some panels where, where these types of conversations are happening um, occur where we have, you know, 
folks sitting in the more comfortable chairs um, who then sort of espouse some of their knowledge or whatever, and then everybody else is kind of expected to soak it up and listen. Um, and I think what we're much more interested in is how each one of us, as I said before, uh, can have an influence uh, on this conversation and is impacted by this type of conversation. So what we want to do now um, is we want to shift into a little uh, uh, an exercise on your paper there. So on your paper, you'll have one side that says activity one, yeah? And what we're going to do is uh, the, the panel is just going to read some statements, yeah? And if you identify with the statement as true, like that statement is true for me, then you don't have to do anything. You just, just keep, keep relaxing. Um, if it's not true for you, if you don't identify with that statement as true, then just make a little tick mark in that, you know, in the box next to statement one. Yeah? So we're just going to, we'll, we'll read through those and then, and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. So, uh, Torvi, do you want to start with <coughs> statement one and then we'll go around? Yeah. Um, so, statement one, the leader of my country is also the person of my racial group. So again, if you agree with that statement, you don't have to do anything. If you don't agree with that statement, tick a, a, tick a little box. Uh, statement two, in public, I can kiss and hold hands with the person I am dating without fear of name calling or violence. Number three, when someone is trying to describe me, they do not mention my race. Number four, when I am angry or emotional, people do not dismiss my opinions as symptoms of that time of the month. Sure. Number four, when I am angry or emotional, people do not dismiss my opinions as symptoms of that time of the month. Uh, number five, when expressing my opinion, I am not automatically assumed to be a spokesperson of my race. Uh, when expressing my opinion, I am not automatically assumed to be uh, the spoke person of my race. Statement six, I can easily find hair products and people who know how to style my hair. Number seven, if I am going out to dinner with friends, I do not worry if the building will be accessible to me. Number eight, I can be certain that when I attend an event, there will be people of my race there. Number nine, people do not make assumptions about my work ethic or intelligence based on my body. Statement number 10, when I strongly state my opinion, people see it as assertive rather than aggressive. Number 11, when I am with others of my race, people do not think that we are segregating ourselves. Number 12, I can usually afford, without much hardship, to do the things that my colleagues want to do for entertainment. Statement 13, when filling out forms for school or work, I easily identify with the box that I have to check. Statement number 14, I do not worry about walking alone at night. Number 15, if pulled over by a police officer, I can be confident that I have not been singled out because of my race. Number 16, my expertise is never questioned because of my age. Number 17, I can choose the style of dress that I feel comfortable in and most reflects my identity and I know that I will not be stared at in public. Statement number 18, people do not make assumptions about my intelligence based upon my style of speech. Number 19, I can book an airline flight, go to a movie, ride in a car, and not worry about whether there will be a seat that can accommodate me. Number 20, people assume I was admitted to school or hired based upon my credentials rather than my race or gender. 
finally number 21. As a child, I could use the flesh-colored crayons to color my family and have it match our skin color. Okay, so what we're going to do now is ask you to uh, break into small groups of four. So just sort of turn your chairs this way. So like a little huddle here, little huddle here. Folks who are online, we are going to, uh, the, the panel is going to discuss these. But basically what's going to happen, get into these little groups, and then we're going to give those small groups a chance to just have a conversation about how this activity felt, and we'll have some prompting questions. Yeah, so if we can just get those little groups to, Didn't so the these four yeah. here, maybe yeah. these four here. <laughs> oh God, we'll figure out. Sort of, if, you five, five. if you have to do five, that's five. If you have to do five, that's okay as well. There we go. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we could do two Hello, groups. <laughs> Some, some prompting questions, if I can, just for a sec. You're going to have, you know, about 10 minutes to, to just chat. You're not going to have to come up and, like, represent your group or say, you know, your deepest feelings or something like that. So, so um, this is just for this small group. And basically the questions that we want you to think about, one, how did you feel doing this activity? What was your experience like? Um, how was it to consider the number of tally marks that you had on your page? Um, how was it to notice, were you aware of other people next to you? Uh, or in your vicinity who are making tally marks and how many they were making, um, and, and, and allow that to kind of open up that conversation around maybe thoughts you have around privilege or thoughts you have around your experience in this. Again, this is just a very tip of the iceberg because we only got 50 minutes, but we're going to have about 10 minutes to get to chat with the group about that, and then we'll come back and we'll do another, another thing, okay? And folks online, you'll be hearing us talk, but you all won't. <laughs> okay. Ooh. Hello, onlineers. Hello, onlineers. Hello, onlineers. Um, so I hope you are all doing that online. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you all are doing it, and hopefully you all can hear us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, this hopefully is a very surreal can. discussion. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so? So, yeah, so, I mean, obviously, some of us in this group have done this activity before, but yeah. I, 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 mean, I certainly always find it interesting to do. What, what, were, what was your experience of doing it this time? How did mm. you feel? What were your thoughts? It um. didn't make it much easier for me. Um, I think the first time we did this, there was definitely things that I didn't consider, I think. Um, but to the point of, not necessarily that I didn't consider that they're a thing, but I've, I'm s they're so normalized, those yeah. kind of things, that I hadn't really considered the, the fact that some people don't think about those things. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's like, hang on a minute, wait, some people don't have to think about that? <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. that's so true. Um, so that I think I found that the most striking and actually the first time I did this I was left feeling quite troubled afterwards mm. I remember going home that evening and being quite angry mm. and, and feeling quite upset yeah. and just yeah. like feeling quite frustrated yeah. that this is a thing that yeah. it's like you know being pointed out to you that yeah. you yeah. are much more underprivileged than yeah. you might associate with yourself yeah. and it's like that's that's kind of alarming to digest. I think the second time I now I know about it, I've obviously had time to think about that yeah. and to digest it and sort of come to terms yeah. with <laughs> those differences yeah. and how they are, but I think it's a really useful exercise for people to to check. Yeah. Like actually there's so many things that I didn't even think about other people having to do and, yeah. and I'll be interested in some of the breakout conversations because um, I remember when we did this at Rodi and we had the, the, the breakout afterwards. Yeah. Even when we were doing the discussion afterwards, there were still some people saying, well, I don't understand. Why would anyone be scared walking home at night? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and, and just oh. would not understand. Oh. And, um, you know, I was trying to put it into a context of saying, well, you know, or, or why was that relevant? Why is it relevant about that in relation to work? And I said, well, think about it. It could be down to expenses. If you had someone that was doing expenses and said, why did you get an Uber um, as an expense when you weren't traveling abroad? Why did you get an Uber in London? <coughs> I was like, well, it was late at night and I don't feel comfortable walking mm. late at night. That's why, and having someone that understands that as a single woman at night time, that is a valid concern yeah. of why yeah. you might have that expense wow. mm. in regards to someone else who didn't decide to expense a taxi and walked. Right? Mm. So it's, it's these kind of little everydays that I think it's worth bringing us back to and how it's yeah. relevant. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, what was your experience? When I did this exercise for the first time, um, I mean, I was aware of these things, but when you see how many ticks you have compared to others, the interesting bit is um, you start to think like, uh, oh, okay, this is why um, I 
have other different behaviors around men in my company or like I'm nervous around men because maybe I'm scared of them in general outside or something like that. Mm. So it, it just made me realize like there's so many other little behaviors I have mm. that come out in the workplace even though it's a safer setting yeah. uh, because I have that in, out in public. Yeah. So um, yeah, that, that was like the most... Uh, yeah. Oh no, I need to do something about that, so I'm giving my full self to the work. Yeah. That was very interesting. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's, for me, I mean, I knew I was going to come up at about half. Mm. That was what I anticipated and that's what happened yeah. because I thought, you know what, there's some stuff that definitely does not affect me because I'm white. It's mm. literally that simple. Mm. But um, I'm white and Western. But at the same time, I, did, I find it kind of, it was almost like an emotional like feeling of shock mm. the first time I read it all the way through because I thought, but partly because some of these things have are clearly are to do with survival techniques that have become so normalized, they've become so subconscious that you just, it's like asking a fish about the water, you just don't notice them until someone points them out. Um, versus like a, a couple of questions are things that, for example, I've ended up having fights about with partners yeah. and things like that, that are almost like, they're so relevant <coughs> that they would affect our day in, mm. day out existence and dominate our public interactions. I mean, in my case, that's number two. Like yeah. that was that was something that has been like a consistent point of tension, yeah. mm. like a di an everyday discussion yeah. with a partner. And so, like, it's hard to see it in black and white and know that that doesn't affect like so many people. Um, but at the same time, it's like, well, it's good that it doesn't affect them. It's just not good that it affects me. Yeah. <laughs> there are things on here which seem so small, but I would say this, the stuff on here, I think the reason why it resonated that I, is I realized things like number 13, mm. when filling out forms for school or work, I easily identify with the box that I have to check. Because of the amount of forms I've had to fill out over my life where I've had to tick other, there was a time in my life where I referred to myself as other. Yeah. Like, just tick other. I'll always just be other. Because yeah. there's never, ever a description. Yeah, yeah. Let's take about two more summarized. minutes. Two more minutes, Kang. Um, two more minutes for so this, that, and then we're going to circle back up. Two that minutes. That particular statement, you know, sort of really resonates with me. Of ca actually, what that does to someone when you force them to constantly feel like they don't fit in with anyone yeah. else. Yeah. Like, there's never, yeah. like, you're always an other. And, yeah. I mean, for some of these things, just because that's how I work now, that is actually what inspires me to yeah. Yeah. do stuff. Because it's like, well, you know, you can. Yeah, that's if, if I'm going to yeah, be a statistic yeah. and I'm going to be an other, I'm going to be a bloody good other, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, Thank you. And, uh, and things like number six, I can easily find hair products and people who know how to style my hair. It's like the amount of time it takes me to do my hair is like a day. And when you live a busy life, it's like people don't get that. Even my husband doesn't get that. Like it's difficult yeah. to schedule with work. It's like, yeah. you know, you have to learn to do these things yourself. You have to sacrifice time. You know, you're going to have to stay up late at night to do. It's like all of these kind of little things that you forget about. But I would say the number 13 is one that really sort of resonated. I mean, the whole thing just feels like both. Uh, it, it all feels so connected to violence to me. Mm. Yeah. Like the, the exercise feels like it has the potential to feel really violent and mm. violating. The the experience, you know, going home at night, like the questions often relate to violence. Like there is such a, a violence that is uh, exerted upon folks um, in various ways and at various levels. Yeah. It, you know, every day in and out of all situations, you know, and that's where like I love the exercise and I also slightly am like. I, 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 it's it's like a very uh, it, I, I want to treat it very gingerly because yeah. it is it does have that ability to to yeah. violate even just the doing it. It's like it, it's yeah. helpful but it hurts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it does yeah. hurt. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna pull him. I'm gonna pull him back in. Okay. Okay. So if I can get if I can get folks to just t take a pause just just for one sec, uh, uh, maybe j just turn turn back this way. We'll we'll you're gonna get to talk to these folks again a little bit um, uh, with this next thing that we're doing. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> so, uh, so, so now what we're going to do, uh, again, uh, similar format. Okay, we're just trying to keep it consistent for the, for the purpose of this, uh, the amount of time that we have. Uh, but so what we're going to do is now we're going to switch to the activity two on your sheet. And again, we're going to read some statements. And uh, what you're going to do, I mean, pretty self-explanatory, but based on the statement that we read, uh, mark if you are one, not at all comfortable, two, uneasy, three, fairly comfortable, four, 
completely <laughs> comfortable. Again, you're not going to have to show your scores or tell him up or something like that. It, it's fodder for being able to have another conversation with this small group that you've been having a conversation with. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So we'll read through again. It's you know uh, 21 statements, and then and then we'll dive into these groups again for for a brief uh, chat. Corby, you want to start? Statement one: A friend invites you to go to a gay bar. Yeah, can we get a little bit more on the mic? Actually, there you go. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Uh, a friend invites you to go to a gay bar. That's statement one. Statement two. A homeless person approaches you and asks for change. Societal or monetary, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Number three. Your new flatmate is Palestinian and Muslim. Number four, a co-worker uses a wheelchair. Number five, a group of young black men are walking towards you on the street. Statement six, your colleague is a fundamentalist Christian. Number seven, your sibling invites their transgender partner to dinner. Number eight, your dentist is HIV positive. Number nine, your manager is a Muslim woman who wears a headscarf and a full length robe. Full length robe. Number 10. Full length. Full length. Oh. Full length. length. Top to bottom. Yeah. Uh, your manager is a Muslim woman. Sorry. Yeah. Statement 10. A group of young white men are walking towards you on the street. Number 11. The young man sitting next to you on the airplane is praying quietly in Arabic. Number 12, the newly hired member of your team tells you they regularly experience panic attacks. Number 13, the woman sitting next to you on, the, on a plane weighs 300 pounds. Number 14, your brother's new girlfriend is a single mother on welfare. Number 15, your family buys a home in a predominantly black neighborhood. Number 16, your black flatmate gets a full tuition minority scholarship. Number 17, your new co-worker has been in prison. Number 18, your friend is putting herself through school by engaging in sex work. Uh, your friend is putting herself through school, is paying for school by engaging in sex work. Number 19, one of your group presentation members has a speech impediment. Number 20, a member of your company's executive team is visually impaired. Number 21, and the last one, you are asked to prepare a presentation on diversity for your community. OK. <coughs> so, uh, so again, 21 questions. Here they are in case you want to reference them. Uh, we're going to do the same thing where in that same group of people that you were meeting with last time, uh, the, the prompting questions for you to talk about off the back of this activity, you know, were you surprised by the numbers that you saw? Um, you know, were there particular questions that felt easier to answer, more difficult to answer? Um, you know, what, was the, what was the experience across the group? Was it common? Was it, did it vary? And again, uh, you know, the, the purpose of the exercise is not to judge that you know, four is good and one is bad. The purpose of the exercise is to encounter. 
right? Is to encounter the questions and, and try to see what that encounter feels like, right? So, um, so we're going to have 10 minutes again to connect as a small group. Um, you're not going to have to present or anything like that. Same thing. Just connect as a small group around this activity. And then at the, uh, at the finish of that, we will have a little bit of time to, um, to field some questions. And we're going to ask that we do those questions digitally. Um, there's a link which we will put up on the screen just so that people who are joining us digitally can also submit questions if they want to have their voice heard. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so why don't we go into the small groups and we'll have about uh, nine, ten minutes to be able to talk in that way. Thanks so much. Hello again, gang. <laughs> Hello. Hello. This exercise, even though I've done it three to four times, still makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> this one makes me less uncomfortable than the first one. Yeah. I mean, it actually makes me less uncomfortable than the first one as well. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Yeah. I feel like with this one, I there are some which maybe because of having had the experience, mm -hmm. I feel like I can answer quite credibly and yeah. then there are others where maybe I want to think that you know yeah that'd be mm. fine you hope and then, you'd respond yeah, I hope that I would respond in that way but then yeah. I I sort of that's when I kind of feel like well actually you know <laughs> am I really am I really that that uh, you know able to, to, to not be affected um, <laughs> how enlightened am I yeah or yeah, yeah. Just I mean I know there's there's for most of these, I'm pretty comfortable and I can relate it to real world experience, but I know there's some where I, I would feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and there's some which it's because of experience that I would feel uncomfortable. Mm. And some of them, you know, it is, it is probably very selfish why I would feel that way, uh, you know, which is also interesting to consider how mm. that feeling would make someone else feel. For right. instance, obviously, mm. I travel quite frequently on airplanes, and it wouldn't bother me if someone was praying quietly in Arabic, but it would bother me if someone was 200 pounds sat next to me, right. just because I've been on a flight where I sat in the middle of two people that both were 200 pounds, right. and from my overall flying experience, yeah. it was quite uncomfortable. Yeah. But I probably focused more on how I felt uncomfortable than how they probably felt uncomfortable, the fact that they knew right. that yeah. I was uncomfortable, yeah. if you get what I mean, because yeah. that must also be a really awkward, like, you can't mm. suddenly not be 300 pounds to get on the plane, yeah. and if you know that the person in the middle is most uh, indignant yeah. that you are sharing seats now, right. you know, that obviously makes them feel really uncomfortable yeah. as well, and yeah. I probably didn't think about that yeah. at the time. I've more thought about my own personal space and freedom being compromised. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting to kind of reframe some of these assumptions into yeah. the other mm. point of view. Yeah. 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 It feels like with that one, you know, <coughs> for me it kind of raises the question around what we hold people accountable for uh, uh, in either societal or institutional ways mm. that they may or may not have any control over at all, right? Mm. So, you know, there are various structures which um, force people to be accountable for something that others don't have to be accountable for, mm. and neither of them have done anything to actually merit that sort of um, oppressive accountability, right? Yes. Uh, oppressive accountability, I like that. I'm recycling that. <laughs> Yeah. The one I keep changing my answer on is that you are asked to prepare a presentation on diversity for your community. Because <laughs> I've done this twice. You're like, how's it going? I'm not sure. Or now I'm like, really, I should be too. <laughs> because it's so funny being the brown person doing that. Even though I'm like, I just can put things in that I know will make sense. But yeah. at the same time, being that person is so much pressure. Cause yeah. Um, Do you know what it's interesting yeah. about that one for me is I would not be a four on that either. Yeah. And I think it's why I struggled at first a little bit of even being involved in this. It goes back to that and the initial bias that when I do something, I don't become a spokesperson of my race. Mm. It's almost exactly. like by doing some of these things, it's like I always said I, I'm never going to speak on a panel unless I'm there because of my skills. Um, and, I, and I decided I was going to... Um, participate in this exercise but I think it's almost like if I was chosen to prepare the presentation on diversity for the community I would want to understand why it's me that is preparing it rather than being you know the, the token person because I have I have filled that role before I did it at Lipper I was I was the first ever student person to join the board of directors at Lipper 
and Mark Featherstone Whitty asked me personally to join and it was just in the investors and the directors of Lifa and I was the first student member there and it was because apart from the fact that, like if I'd been gay as well it would have been ideal for them basically because <laughs> all of the other boxes I could tick so I then became the spokesperson for women in the sound tech, the spokesperson for yeah. Um, yeah. you know mothers, the spokesperson from someone coming from an underprivileged background, the spokesperson for uh, race, that, you know, all of yeah, them those yeah. kind of representatives and then they didn't have a board for equality and diversity or widening participation so I started both of those and you know, I think it worked out quite well in the end because of the influence and what happened but I did think in retrospect afterwards the only reason I was there was because I was chosen to be that token individual mm. and which is what why this then can become uncomfortable. Yeah. 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 And the thing about that is also that um, I've been through all this. Do I now have to talk about it yeah. as well? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I really don't want to engage in this anymore and just get on with life. So to make my <laughs> personal experience a learning experience for yeah. people. <laughs> That's the thing, yeah. yeah. So. Which is funny because, I mean, I put a three because I, I'm i always tensive towards um, diversity panels to do with, my, to do with ethnicity, essentially, yeah. because I'm I'm just like, I mean, I, who wants to hear the white person speak? Nobody really. Like, it's just, it's, it's not my place to speak. But because, because I'm queer, like, I've, I've sort of come around on the idea. I'm like, that is also a part of diversity. People also need to be talking about this. And so, like, I, I feel like I have something to offer. But also, I'm aware that, like, I still kind of had a little bulk because I, I'm someone who personally is in the habit of being someone who will put their hand in the air if they see nobody else is. Mm. Like, I've always been that kid mm. to be that, oh, no one's doing it. Well, I guess I'll do it. And so knowing that about myself, I always always kind of question it a little bit. I'm like, am I playing into a little pattern here? Is that amplified because I'm queer? Like, you know, so I sort of have to step back and be like, mm, is this a good idea? Like every time something like this rolls around. And I'm more comfortable with it now than I used to be, but I still have to question it. Just take two more minutes, gang. Two more minutes, two more minutes on this, and then we'll regroup. Yeah, two minutes. Another one that threw me off was the homeless person approaches you and asks for a change. Mm -hmm. And I put a two down because it's true and it really annoys me that that's true. Mm. Um, because I am thinking man and I'm thinking danger. Mm. Um, yeah. But See, I, it's just really annoying that that happens. I think that I am far too comfortable with that to the point where maybe I should be less comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, search out that opportunity. Um, <laughs> like, it wouldn't be odd if one time you decided that you should take the train home via Waterloo, and as you walk into the station, you notice, is that Sarah sitting on the floor next to a homeless person? <laughs> uh, because, like, I, I kind of, like, I did quite a lot of work for shelter when I was younger, and I think the one thing about being homeless is not just about being short of change. It's that no one talks to you like a person. Mm, yeah. So I try to yeah. really engage and like find out a little bit um, about the person. Yeah. And um, there was a guy on the overground once. I wrote a poem about it and put it on my Facebook, but I don't have time to say it now. <laughs> His name was Luke. You can find it on my Facebook. And I read a poem. And it's very good. Okay, so uh, cool. so if I can, uh, can I just have folks sorry, sorry, pull, sorry. Uh, wrap up yeah. and uh, you know obviously lots more to talk about, but just pull back into the circle. <laughs> Um, and what we're going to do is, uh, in order to, in order to, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, so, so let's turn back in, let's turn back in, uh, just so we can see each other. Um, uh, so what, what we want to do now, um, in order to, to try and make it fair to the folks who are joining online, the, the millions, um, uh, <laughs> Here is a, here's just a, a simple Google form uh, that folks can submit questions to uh, if they have questions for, for the panel um, in order for us to be able to respond you know, to whatever those might be. Um, we have a, you know, one or two that have come in, and then if anybody wants to, to tap in some, um, we'll do that. You know, again, we only have five minutes, and obviously these are conversations which um, are lifelong conversations for, 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 for all of us. Uh, so I think we'll just be able to kind of catch a couple of, a couple of questions. Um, you know, one question that I, that, uh, that I thought I would 
answer right off the bat uh, was sort of why have a, uh, you know, assumingly white cisgendered male uh, leading or moderating, let's say, a, a panel on uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think that the, the brief answer would be that, um, you know, I think at, in an industry like the tech industry and the music tech industry and the music industry, um, which is predominantly white and male, um, my argument would be that um, there is some sort of balance that needs to be found, and this is a balance that I would say I struggle with every day, of where I need to be accountable and responsible to sit up and shut up, um, you know, or uh, uh, you know, step up and step back uh, around uh, my role in this and my, um, my responsibility around trying to be a part of the conversation without trying to dominate the conversation. And one of the things we were talking about in the group was not having this type of scenario where you've got a bunch of, you know, women, black and brown folk who are here to sort of educate uh, folks about their experience. Porfer was talking about not having your personal experience turn into a learning experience. Um, and so, so for me, uh, that was why it felt like, especially with a community of audio developers, which often is a, is a more homogenous community at this point in society, uh, that's why that felt important. Um, another question that came through on uh, was, um, uh, at a company, at my company, we're mostly white and male, but we want to make a change, but we just don't get the applications. Um, how do these systemic issues get addressed? Like, how do we, how do we change, how do we change the paradigm? Um, any, any thoughts there uh, from the assembled panel? Yeah, um, I think part of it is to do with um, we need to pay attention to where we're advertising and how we're sharing that information. At the end of the day, if you're, um, if you're sending your adverts to, um, obviously to places like LinkedIn and things, but to audio magazines where you're predominantly going to be bought by people who look like you, then um, those are the people who are going to make the applications. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to think a bit creatively and you know, kind of really get your heads together to think about where you are sharing information about the fact that that job is available. Um, interestingly, I found out about this job with Roly through um, someone who was um, who was non-binary and who was studying music, um, and they'd heard about it because Roly had um, run some workshops with the course that they were taking. So it's to do with how how are you <coughs> spreading your information? Where are you spreading your information? Uh, so another. Oh, sorry. Another question, uh, is this, a, is this in these topics, is that a music tech issue or is it more just an issue in society? Like what's the, what's the relationship between it being a music tech industry or, or a tech? Sarah, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Uh, um, I think obviously there are societal issues, I think, uh, within the music tech community, potentially things are amplified because it's a smaller community and, you know, in terms of overall percentages of, you know, any minority, be that how you define it, the numbers are smaller and that's quite obvious the more that you exist within that space and, and communicate in that space. So I would say it's not, um, there's not a separation between society and, and music tech, but um, music tech there clearly is. It is apparent there, and because that's a community that we all work in and that we love and we support, then it's somewhere where we can have an immediate action to try and yeah. impact that. So it's the most relevant to us. Yeah, and even if you look at studios, um, a lot of the producers are older men, and when they try, you know, when you go and in do internship at a studio and you're making tea in the beginning before you get to touch the mixing console, um, they really look for someone. Um, and subconsciously, not consciously, someone who reminds them of themselves, and I probably am not that person. So, if there is that person, does exist, like there's another intern who looks like them, who makes reminds them of their youth, they're probably gonna naturally or, you know, try to push that person forward. And I've seen that happen where I've just made tea for far too long, and I'm like, okay, bye, <laughs> gonna go work at Rolly. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, we basically, we're pretty much at time, and I know folks have the, this uh, talk at five, I guess, one that's maybe relevant in terms of, you know, accountability. Um, you know, what is Roly doing to address this, right? There's, you have a panel of four Roly people rather than drawing from a, a broader community, and I think the goal with that was to um, 
try to use it as an opportunity for us as well to look to look in the mirror. I think Roly is succeeding in the sense that it is trying to, across its team, foster this conversation. I think uh, it is a long way from something that I think really should be patting itself on the back too much about, um, you know, we are still a majority male, majority white uh, organization. We um, are certainly not beating any of the percentages that, you know, that exist in this industry. And I think that while we do things like, you know, post our job specs in particular ways and, and you know, ensure that the language is non-biased and, and that kind of thing, I think there's, uh, there is a chasm that we are trying to figure out how to stretch across <coughs> between active discussion and building awareness and taking institutional action. Um, and if anybody wants to talk about things like quotas or something like that, would love to, to discuss perhaps over a tea. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think we, I think we kind of have to, to wrap now um, uh, just because of time. But uh, thank you all so much for coming. Really appreciate it. I know this stuff is hard to talk about sometimes and really appreciate everybody's willingness to go there. And thank you to everybody on the panel. Yes. 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 Of course. Uh, feel free to email. Uh, yeah. yeah well, community it, at Rolly. Yeah. Com. Community. Okay. Community at Rolly is fine, and we'll give you a long answer. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you to everybody doing tech. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yes. Snapped. <laughs> <laughs>